And we'll go over this a little bit as we get into it. And now I just want to tell you what these are. So you see I have pre-10 year old. Um, and I only put 10 because that's sort of the politically correct thing right now. This could be pre-11 year old or pre-9 year old or pre-7 year old. And it's just the entry level. Pre, uh, age 10 or so to puberty is sort of the second stage and um, again this tennis your child's tennis should you should look at it like the standpoint of uh, there's participation ages and then there becomes performance age and, and this is the way really participation ages are when they get into it in lots of different kinds of formats lots of different venues Family tennis, fun tennis, little dipping in here and there with uh, tournament tennis, but you have to sort of judge that one. But about puberty or so, the second page you can see that becomes age-related uh, tennis or, or more performance-related, and that's what that is. I put puberty to 15, 16 becomes very, very important. Or it could be puberty to 17. It could be 15 to 17. It just depends on the maturity level of the children. Again, you have four, some 14-year-old boys that are shaving. Other 16-year-old boys, you know, uh, they're basically got peach fuzz. Uh, you know, and, and some girls mature very quickly. At 12 years old, they're hitting the ball really, really well, and some don't until they're 16. So it, it just this this is a reference. So and to tell you what it is, then the third page is, er, I, the questions I always get is, what should my child do, be doing getting ready for college? So this is a wonderful handout a man named Kyle Bailey put together and gave me permission to pass it out. And it basically talks about what your child should be doing in school and what your child should be doing with their tennis in contact with coaches. So that's what that is. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get ready to get started here. In a, in a second, so in the Marine Con Con uh, Conley Brinker Foundation, it epitomizes as you are finding out everything that is good, noble, right, and uplifting with tennis. And, and uh, as many many years ago, like maybe Cecil and we, when we were starting tennis back in the days in, in Shreveport, Louisiana, and Carol, when we were starting tennis, we never ever ever looked at tennis as something that we could get something out of. From the start, if, if, if I can say anything at all to all of you, and I'm going to bring up some things. I'm going to first show you some discouraging things, and then I'm going to try to show you some uplifting things as we go on. And today we're going to do one hour. Tomorrow we're going to do one hour. Tomorrow's going to be on scheduling. And that's a big, big thing. It's probably where everybody messes up. And I'll give you some insights on scheduling and planning your career there. But what I wanted to say is from the start, <laughs> As a youngster when I was starting, a season, in the old days, you never looked at tennis as, oh, I can get something out of tennis. Like, this is something for me. Tennis was designed for me. And we, we always said that you, it must start with some, being something that you honor. You honor the game of tennis, it will honor you back. You honor the game of tennis, you respect your opponents. And that's the, that's the whole essence of it. It's like... Tennis is like music. It's as hard as the violin or harder. It's the hardest of all sports. It's, and I, I would not fool you in saying that this is an easy sport and uh, everybody can do it. Everybody can play to an extent. But hard to pick up is very hard to put down. Easy to pick up is easy to put down. I made the comment at, at one of the USTA meetings I told, I said, it should be looked at with something of respect that is hard to pick up and hard to put down. I said, we don't want to make tennis into bowling. And I'm no offense if there's a bowler in here, but everybody in the world has bowled once. But is there any bowler in the room here? Is there a bowler? Anybody that bowls three days a week? Anybody? All right, point is, is you could, you could play tennis every day of your life and never be a tennis player. You could go to school every day of your life and never be a student. You could play music every day of your life and never be a musician. What we have to do from the start, and it's with, with, from the start, our children need to understand that this is something that if you honor it, it will honor you back. And it is not set up to serve you. 
the, the Marine Connolly Brinker Foundation and these Little Mo events, the respect is nationwide. It is not something that is seasonal. It is not something that is in and out. It's something that when people talk about the Little Mo tournaments, Carol, they talk about them with honor. They talk about them with great respect. And they talk about them in a way that it's, it's a prestigious thing that they honor. It's noble and it's good. I'm going to start out today, and I'm going to show you a short video, but I'm going to, Friday, I try to read the paper now and then, this is the Wall Street Journal, and then Friday, if any of you uh, read it, it said, Mama, don't let you, no, it said, don't let your babies grow up to be tennis pros, if anybody read, read this article. This article is about all of the great tennis players today, and it's about how all of these players are saying, eh, we don't know if we want our children to grow up to be tennis pros. We know a little bit too much about how hard it is. And before I go any further and any more discouraging, not once in the article did they ever go back and say, I wish I had never played. Every, not one of them, have ever said that. By the way, is there anything that's ever been hard and beneficial in your life that if you'd known how hard it was when you started out, would you go back and do it again? Would you be a parent again? I mean, would you, <laughs> would, you, would, you, would, you would you go to college again? Would you take on a job again? Would you take on anything? The point is, is that everything that is noble and good is hard to do. And there is a saying that I've always used in coaching. When you bring players along that you never show them how tough things are at the start. And so if, with, the, with the impression, oh, you're going to be a pro and this and this and this, and we make the mistake of taking our kids to NBA games instead of high school basketball games. And right away, we show them how hard high Mount Everest is. The saying is this, is that you keep fog as a teacher, as a parent, as a coach. You keep fog on top of the mountain till the kids are too high up to turn back. It's not always important for them to know how hard it is. But this whole article is dozens of pros, past and present, all said that while they would likely they'd introduce their children to the love of spinach, they would not urge them to turn pro. These parents could be passing wisdom on to their children. Chances for greatness in tennis are just so tiny and it decreases every year as the sport takes root in so many places around the world. It's so expensive. It's so hard to be good at. Right now on the men's side only 14 players in the whole United States are making a living. Only 14. If you were in the NBA, what, 500 are making a good living. In the NFL, 1,500 are making a good living. So if you think this is discouraging, I have a short video here. Click on that thing a couple times. Building a career inch by inch. Click on it. Oops. Okay, you went forward here. I go back. Go back. My computer's persnickety here. Go here. This is how hard becoming a professional is. I always show this to parents. <laughs> This is how hard it is, folks. You ready? Two minutes. <coughs>
commercials. So, I always show this, and I I start out by go ahead. Just push the X I always uh, start out when I, when I try to talk to parents is that by the time we're done this week, weekend, this week with um, the clinic, and then also by the time that you're done with this tournament, I hope that you can answer the question, forget playing professional, forget even going to college, if you could enthusiastically embrace why your youngster plays tennis you're on your way. And, and you know what? As a result, they probably played college tennis. There's more opportunities, even with 400 teams being dropped in the last 10 years. In colleges, there's still more opportunities in tennis than any other sport, I think, except basketball and a, and a couple others. And, and by the way, your child will grow up learning every important lesson that there is to learn. And know how to handle confrontation in a way where they don't back down. There's three stages in confrontation. First of all, you're wimpy, then you're a jerk, then you stand up. Usually they have to go through all these. And kids who are bullies usually win early when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. And your child who's maybe a little more mild-mannered learns how to stand up for themselves. And they get to the place where they don't back down and they don't get mad they learn how to handle it. They learn how to handle confrontation. By the way, don't ever run any referees and things for your, your kids. Let your kids take care of that stuff. You know, don't ever interfere once the, once the contest is going on. You're emotionally involved. I'm emotionally involved with my children. I'm a beginner at being a parent. I have six children, and I'm a beginner at, at being a parent. And they're, because they're all different, and every one of them handles confrontation, success, failure, all in different ways. And so the point is, is that this is their thing. It's like music, it's like art, it's like dance. It's like cursive writing. Nobody learns how to do cursive writing anymore, do they? These are all ways that we learn, the kids learn how to express themselves. This is the mountain of the, the journey that I call it. And you can compare till the 80% point. Most of the clinics I do are for high performance situations and my clinics are usually called the last 20% of overcome, overcoming 80% <coughs> paralysis. 100, I won't say 100, 90% of our kids in the United States get right here. They get to the 80% point because we have great coaches, we have great facilities, we have great opportunities, we have parents that are supporting them, and we have all these things that help the children get up the mountain. But we have a log jam of talent right here. 1982, we had 39 players that had gone to college that made it to the top 100 in ATP. 30, 39. <coughs> Today, we only have one. It's been 20 years since we've had a young lady, Lisa Raymond, go to college and come out and be the top 100 in the world. College is in trouble. We're doing a lot of things wrong right now that I hope get, get solved. But the point, the point being is that we also do a very good job of getting our kids through these stages. And try to look at on those sheets that I gave you, the checklist. The early success is repetition, repetition, repetition. Your children will zoom up the mountain according, proportional to the amount of work that they do right now. If they work hard, they'll get better. And that will happen to about the 50th percentile or 60th percentile. Then what happens is improvement slows down and it gets harder. Maybe they find out that there's this pressure involved. By the way, I don't, I don't want to forget to say this, so I'm saying it now. The minute your child decides, I really want to go after this, I really want to work hard, they usually play worse for about two months because there's this new element called pressure. If you care and if you dare, pressure will always be there. When they just play the game, Usually before puberty, they just play the game. You remember before puberty what we did? Double flips off the high diving board. We used to build ramps out in the 
we're out, out in the alley for our bikes, you know, that we'd zoom up them and we'd come home bruised every day and we never thought about danger. We'd hunt for snakes and do all these crazy things before puberty. We just, your children are like this with competition. They're having a ball. And it's great if they get the recall buttons early to where they learn how to win and they're comfortable with winning and they get their fundamentals down before puberty. But right about puberty, everything changes. Everything changes. And it, it, phys it gets physically tougher. You have to have hunger to improve, good scheduling, new pressure of expectations. We'll talk all about scheduling tomorrow. But the expectations go up. Parents expect more. All of a sudden it becomes, wow, the game of tennis is letting me down. It's not, there's no payback for all the work I'm doing. And this is the way it is with anything that is good. Uh, we usually tell the kids the hard work you're doing now in April will pay off in August. It's usually six months or seven months or a year. But they have to approach the game of tennis with a mindset that I will do the right things. I'll honor the game and it will honor me. Today we were taught, you, you might have heard the saying, we gave them sayings at every break today. But one of them is it's more important what happens in you than what happens to you. And they really must believe, and we told them that there are good goods, good bads, <coughs> bad goods, and bad bads. And some of you live in the South might know this, but in Enterprise, Alabama, they have a statue. I don't know what I'm thinking about this. They have a statue erected to the bull weevil. Did you all know this? Mm -hmm. Huh? It's built in Alabama? Okay, so I thought it was Enterprise, Alabama, a little bitty town down there and stuff between Montgomery and Montgomery Mobile. Station, okay. The bull weevil. And the point is, this was because it was the greatest blessing the South had ever had. Of course, the bull weevil came across and destroyed all the cotton crops. And then the, what did the people in the South, the South, Southern farmers, have to learn how to do? They planted peanuts and soybeans. And it made them prosper. And we, so that's why we tell the kids when they make a mistake, we try to get them to say, this is good because. And then they have to answer the question. So you want the kids to always operate good goods and good bads. Bad goods, that, those are, those are, that's the trap. The bad goods, like winning the lottery, it's a trap. Like winning a tennis match where you sort of took a line call, you know, or you know, I didn't train all week and there wasn't any pressure on me, so I just went in and was loose. It played and it, whoa, wait a minute, I just ate a meal I might not be able to digest. And it's, it's always with the kids growing up, it's not what they eat, it's what they digest. They have to transfer their experiences to, to really good, solid things that last for a lifetime. Now, I want you to understand how important this little picture is here because I always talk to the kids about their coaches about the last 20%. This last 20%. Think about the significance when you get here of why this is an overhanging ledge and having to climb it hanging upside down without being able to see anything, just operating completely on faith, the danger of falling, the danger of taking a risk of leaving the security of I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good and life is good and I'm on a college team and everything is great, and wait a minute, going pro is so hard. We'll talk later, today or tomorrow, about what a black, the black door, the, the story of the black door, the legend of the black door, and what it means for kids to break through the new barriers. But the last 20%, you only can get up here either with tremendous faith, tremendous work ethic, tremendous determination, or there's another way. If you have role models that have already climbed that mountain, how is that important? How is that, how is that important? Why is it important to uh, association breeds assimilation, right? Association breeds assimilation. Have you ever wondered how tennis dynasties or sports dynasties stay dynasties? Why North Carolina do keep continue to win in uh, basketball or Alabama, LSU, uh, always win in football. Michigan, Michigan State, there's, there's a tr tradition. They say tradition. Well, there's more to it than that. 
when you have people that have been through the grind, we at uh, Junior Champion <coughs> Center in College Park, Maryland, we're very lucky. We have a young man named Mitchell Frank, who's one of the top players in college tennis. Dennis Kudla, Mitchell Frank, Beatrice Capra, the boy named Junior Orr, all came up from the time they were eight years old with good work ethic. And basically, little by little, other kids started emulating those kids. And then what happens is that their peers started feeding off of that. And then that became the standard. Then that became the bar that the other kids tried to get over. So anyhow, it's, it's real important to be around good people. And if you can't be around very good tennis players, it's not just tennis players that win. Because you could have a tennis player that's winning and be the worst role model in the world for your youngster. So it's real important to have them around. Uh, there's a boy in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, uh, Ronnie Schneider, who was number one Kalamazoo in the boy 16 last year. Now, I interviewed his father uh, one time, and his father, and we're, we're asking him basically what what was it? How did Ronnie get good in Bloomington, Indiana? He said, I took everything that was good, noble, and excellent at Indiana University, their basketball programs and every, and I just tried to have him a good round, good role models, people that were successful, people that did right things. And he said, again, association breeds assimilation. Go ahead, or next. Now, Here's, here's what I wanted to, to uh, talk about, and, and this is one of the most important points. Your youngster must go through this evolution of being compliant. Right now, kids are compliant. They're very good at doing what you want them to do. Earlier, Cecil and I talked about this. How sometimes uh, the kid who is the worst actor and the worst kid ends up becoming a great leader just mainly because they have this need to stand out. I've always, uh, and we'll talk about mentoring a little bit later, but the point is most kids are just compliant. The kid who should win the, the uh, sportsmanship award should not be just the kid that never gets in trouble. This is just a great kid. Oh, they never do anything wrong and they're always going to do it, I love seeing the kid that lives sort of on the edge and ha can go one way or another and they end up making good decisions to go the right way. I, in this sport of tennis, this is a high beta sport, which means it's a dangerous sport. One win, I shouldn't say one wins, one loses, one wins, I don't want to say one dies. But I, when I used to coach uh, men's teams for 33 years at Clemson University, I used to tell the players, you're like a two gladiators in the arena. Once you go out there, you're, you're in the arena. You, you cannot leave. By the way, don't, let, don't ever let your kids come off the court once. We have a rule at the Junior Champion Center that if you go out on the court, if you're fit enough to play, you're fit enough to stay. And you, if, you have, if you have an acute injury, some bleeding or broken something, that's one thing. But to say, oh, my shoulder's sore, or I'm not feeling well, I'm going to come off the court, you know, don't get that started. We tell the kids that you, you start getting a disease called the Q virus, the Q virus, with quitter's virus. And uh, what happens, in the old days, we used to call it the loser's limp. That when kids start <laughs> losing, they, they call it, it's not politically correct, I know, the loser's limp. You can't, oh, you've got the loser's limp because your shoulder started hurting again. But kids will do this, and I've never coached a great player who did not somehow have a disclaimer before the big match just in case that they would lose. Every, every player does this. And they have to get to a point where once, if they're fit enough to play, they're fit enough to stay on the court. Now, there's heat issues and those things, but usually... Kids will, in, in tennis, kids become acclimated to the heat. And usually what happens if they get overheated, they miss balls and they lose. It's usually, there's a few issues where the kids get overheated, but they've got all of these mechanisms in now to, to take care of your children. But the point is, is that they, they have to make a commitment that once they go into that arena, they stay in the arena. So you've got two, I used to tell my players, two gladiators in the arena. One lives, one dies. And hey, listen, you've got a big sword. 
and he's only got a pocket knife. His game isn't as good as yours, but he can still kill you. <laughs> you, you must respect the game. You must honor and respect the game. And guess what? You might have a pocket knife and they might have a big sword. You still have a way to win once you're in that arena. But this is a high beta sport. So it's hard. They go from a, a place of compliance to commitment. They have to take ownership eventually. Somewhere along the line, all good coaches start tra transferring ownership to their youngsters. I don't know, my mama always used to say the two biggest gifts that you can give your children uh, when your parents are roots and wings. We all give them roots. The wings part is the tough one. You know, the wings part is the tough one to kick them out of the nest at certain times. You have to do it a little bit at a time with this sport. But eventually they have to take ownership. Ultimately, you hope they get to a point of being inspired to do what they're doing. And then commitment to having passionate ownership of the process. Ultimately, that's it. It's like my children, they all, we have them all taking piano right now. Like everybody gets their children to take a little music, they take karate, they do the swimming, they do the different things, trying <coughs> to find what they fall in love with. Well, most of the time, at first, they're compliant and they hate to practice until they get a little bit better at it, and then they start liking it a little bit. Maybe one out of three of my children will fall in love with it and have passionate ownership of the process. Recently, the coach at Indiana University is a good friend of mine, very smart guy, and he said, I found this thing by Anthony Robbins that he used to do years ago. Do you remember Anthony Robbins, the late, you know, the pain and pleasure thing? You know, I've used that for your peers, pain and pleasure are the only tools that a coach has. So he says that he had this thing that uh, is called <coughs> RAS, Reticular Activation System. Have any of you heard of this? They've got a 13-minute video on YouTube. You know, and, and by the way, I always use, I start some seminars by saying it's not about information. There's more information on that computer than I could ever give you for sure. And it's the point that you have to get your children to take ownership and attach an emotional, emotional feeling, emotional attachment in their RAS system, the reticular activation system, to what they're doing. The reticular activation system is 13-minute video. It's very boring, but look it up. But it explains everything. Your mind hears during the during the, the thoughts that. You get this from your senses each day, something like you hear 300,000 sounds, but you only let in, you know, like 700 and some or something. You selectively filter out those things that are not important to you. Now, you can imagine where we're at with our children, and I don't have my cell phone, where we're at with our children, how they're being bombarded all day long as they do this, wait a minute, and they do this all day and they get one dimensional input without having to process the information. And it's a very dangerous thing I think because of uh, what's happening in them, not what's happening to them, but it's what's happening in them. But the particular activation system is that when something becomes very, very important for you, you'll start noticing everything about it. I saw many of you standing around the courts today watching your child. Okay, I didn't see anybody just sort of go hang out and have a cup of coffee and talk to par other parents, right? Okay, your reticular activation system is locked in with your children. You notice everything about them. Some of you notice every stroke they make, you notice everything that how they walk, how they talk, everything about them. Nobody else does, but you do. You, do, you don't pick up on other people's children like you do your own. The guy uses the example of you go in to buy a, I use a Ford F-150 pickup truck like I own. I have 313,000 miles on my Ford F-150. So if I wanted to go buy a new Ford F-150, a new one, and I went in to buy it, and then I said, no, nah, I'm not so sure I wanted that one, but that's sort of what I want. As I drove home on the interstate, I would notice every one of them on the interstate. But your mind starts picking up. Ultimately, you want your children to get to a place where they are in love with the process, and they start, Wayne Bryan said one time about the Bryan boys, he said, uh, I let them hang around with tennis, 
He said, be a part of it, et cetera, et cetera. He says, by the time they were second or third graders, they were wearing the wristbands to school. We knew, we knew they were in there, you know, with it. We knew they were in love with it. And uh, you, when your children start having the racket with them and they're starting, wait a minute, what's that? The grip's supposed to be like that. And when they start doing those things, it's kicking in. And once you do that, I think what the ratio, I, I heard it was 14 to 1, a parent or a coach telling a child something, if they tell themselves what they want to do, it's, it's, it's unbelievably powerful. It's 14 to 1, maybe it's 4 to 1, but it's, it's overwhelming. When it becomes important to, to you, it becomes important. No matter how big or how strong. It's like falling in love. You, the first time you fall in love, I fell in love with my wife. I remember every, you notice everything about them. You know, you, you do remember their birthdays back then at first, and, and you do remember the little things. But your reticular activation system kicks in. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. But that's the journey there. In 1980, I was sitting at a National Teachers Conference in New York. Roosevelt Hotel, and I'm a young coach and wanting to learn from the Grand Master, Clarence Mabry, who was coach at Trinity University. Well, first of all, for 20 years, they were 18 years in the top five in the country in college, if you can believe that. And then they went to a D3 program, they changed the D3. But he coached in 1972, Dick Stockton, Bob McKinley, Paul Burke, and Brian Godfrey were all on that same team, and they all became great tennis players. So I was a young coach in the room, and uh, somebody asked, are there any questions at the end? And somebody asked, well, what's the most important quality of a championship tennis player? And uh, everybody's thinking at that time, uh, Nick Volatieri just come out with Jimmy Aries, and big forehands and, you know, the dynamic forehand inside out for. And that's what everybody's thinking. And, and, and this is how he answered. He says, I really believe it's the hunger of an inquisitive mind is the most important quality of a championship tennis player. And that, that feeds, that speaks to the particular activation system. Go ahead. So I thought you'd like this picture. It's a pretty good one. I've got many, many, many of these that I show kids about passion with, 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 the, with different sports figures. I've got some very nice videos. Here's the thing that's great. Um, I've got a couple videos I'll, I'll share with you, you know, today or tomorrow. But the point is, is that this is amazing, this computer. The computers are amazing. If you want to know, uh, your kids are in there listening to a wonderful sports psychologist here from the Air Force Academy. And how good was the, the thing on the eye training? Wasn't that brilliant? Now, why all of you are tennis parents. You know, I've been tennis 40 years, and I've never looked that up on the internet. What? What? It's all laying there right before us. If you want a Russian sports psychologist to know what he's doing with the Olympic team, it's on the internet. If you want to put your child right next to Roger Federer and study the strokes, it's right there on the internet. If you want to know anything in the world, you can look it up on the internet right now. But why don't we? And why don't we seek out what we need? You only remember what you have an emotional attachment with, don't we? Can't you remember songs, being a teenager, your first kiss maybe? Or can't you remember, um, I can still remember the smell of wild onions because I, uh, my basketball coach made us run high school cross country and I hated it so bad that I remember the fall they had wild onions and I still to this day, I was, ugh, you know, it, I can still remember that smell. Can't you still remember the smell of walking in your grandfather's home and the pipe tobacco and things like this? Can't you remember a song and don't you, doesn't it take you right back to a certain point? You know, so we have all this information out there, but, but why, why don't we hunger for it? And why don't our children hunger for it? Now, we, and, and if you think about it, we're doing this, all of this stuff on the computers and all of this stuff, and we're letting our children get all of this information. We've never had more contact with more communication but fewer relationships, have we? I mean, the relationships, our, our children are not building relationships to the place maybe they should. Now, tennis, that's, that's why, that's another reason why it, it's, it's so very, very good. Go ahead. Initiating initiative. 
the challenge of the new generation. And I put these down, I got these from, I asked a few parents, and I put a few down on my own. Thinking deeply, creativity, endurance of concentration and focus. Endurance of concentration and focus. Uh, one of the things, I use loaded language a lot. I call it loaded language, like hit them sweet, move your feet, and have a game that can't be beat, or things like my mother used to say. We walk out the door, she always used to say, don't take any wooden nickels, or love many, trust few, paddle your own canoe. One thing she used to say is, soap is cheap, books are free, never be dirty or dumb. You know, I mean, you know, she had all these things, and I can remember them 40 years later because they're tied with an emotion. But the, the point is about thinking deeply, creativity, the creativity. I mean, if you think about what we've taken out of our school systems, we take music, art, cursive. Why aren't kids using cursive writing? They think it's not important. That's who we are. Did they used to do handwriting analysis to see things about people, to study their personalities? I mean, isn't that where the passion is? Why are we writing? Why are we reading poetry? Why are we doing these things that, are, that get in touch with, the, with our heart? Tennis, to me, sports science helps, but I don't believe that tennis is a sports science. I believe it's, a, it's an affair of the heart. It's an art form. It's something that we're passionately involved with our, our entire life. But the endurance, the concentrate, think the personal decision to stand out, not just to fit in. Uh, I like the outlier kids. I will take on kids who are a little bit out of the ordinary. I have a young man on love I train called the Hurricane. I call him the Hurricane for good reasons. And uh, I always to told his mother it's easier to tame a roaring tiger than an inspired timid pussycat. You know, with, with, I, 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 he's always on the edge, but he's not afraid on the tennis court. He's not afraid to win. He's not afraid to lose. He lets it all out when he's out there. And the point is, is that he's an out-of-the-box kid. We're not doing a lot in our school systems, and I don't want to get into social things, but aren't, aren't we doing a lot of things like they call collaborative education, where we put kids at a table so we're one of a community, and kumbaya, and that everybody's happy, and we're just joining the, everybody's village or a town, you know, together brings us. And the point is, that's not what wins on a tennis court, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, kids need to believe that they stand out. And if you look at all the champions, each champion we have that's out there today, they're great competitors and they have their own way of doing things. And you have Rafael Nadal gets up and does his thing in people's face. You have Federer's laid back way, Serena does her thing. You know, all the players do their own thing. And so it's important that your child develops this own personal way of doing things. Taking ownership in the process journey, willingness to sacrifice for an unknown. I make all the kids I coach watch the movie Miracle and Hoosiers and Rudy. And these are, these are all movies that speak to the king and the queen in our, <coughs> our youngsters. <coughs> now, we as adults become very, very practical and we dumb down the goal setting for our children sometimes. We, it's very, very important that we speak and allow them to speak to their own king and their own queen and themselves. Children should believe they can go to the moon and be an astronaut. They should believe that they can cure cancer. They should believe that they can be president of the United States. And they should believe, they should believe all these things. Their plan B's will become plan A's and their plan C's will become plan A's someday. But they, de they need to develop that entrepreneurship or that feeling that they can go after anything. And so the point is, the willingness to sacrifice for an unknown, the movie, the miracle is wonderful. It, that's the most important line that Herb Brooks brings up. And y'all know the movie? Y'all know the movie about the 1980 hockey team? Yeah. So he, he says this throughout the movie that it was their willingness to sacrifice for an unknown. And whenever I meet with a team or talk to a group of kids and try to motivate them, I said, okay, I am a genie and I have a lamp here and I, I'm a fortune teller. And I've got this lamp and Joe, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's clearing up for me here. It's 2018. Joe, you're playing, what is this? Semifinals Wimbledon against an aging Rafael Nadal. Okay? Oh, he's cramping. 
You win. You're going into the finals at Wimbledon. You play the finals at Wimbledon. And you're being interviewed. Oh, ESPN is interviewing. What'd you say? Oh, you're so glad that you got up every morning, ran 10 miles before breakfast. You're so glad that you watched your diet. You're so glad you did all the extra serves. You're so glad that you did all this and this and this and this. All these things, if this was a fact and this would happen and you knew this would happen, would you make those sacrifices? And of course, all the kids always say, well, for sure I would. Because then you'd be sacrificing for something that is known. But remember the hanging upside down in the last 20%? It really becomes an act of faith. And it really becomes a thing, if they love the sport enough, that they would rather sacrifice and lose than not to go after it. And that's where they have to get to. They would rather sacrifice all and lose and make it a good, bad, than not to go after it. This is one point. I forget what his name is, but he uh, had cancer. Oh, you he could put, hit it on the X. <laughs> uh, he had cancer when he was 11 years old, lost his legs. It's a great story. Of course, he's world champion. And I stayed around. I didn't, I didn't go into the stadium and watch any of the pro matches when I was there. We were with the kids. But the point is, is it's... Uh, I've got so many of these inspiring things that you can watch on YouTube. Y'all ever watch Tony Melendez, guy that plays the guitar with his feet? Y'all? Yo, yo. Okay. Yeah, it's, we might watch it a little later tomorrow, something. we got to stay under the clock here. But the, but the point being is that this stuff is all on the Internet. It's all there right for our children. It's right there to speak to the king and the queen and our youngsters. And, and it's, it's just fantastic. If, if uh, they, they go out, but the experience, doing it and experiencing it are two different things. Let's go forward here. Uh, let's, let's see. Okay, then scroll on that. It'll stay there in a second. See if you want to do We have, um, then basically what, what we have, you'll, Try to figure this sport, as you figure this sport out, uh, I want to show you these right here, and these are just simple, it's an exponential curve of how you basically, you need three things, three parts of the tennis, it's not just forehands and backhands. You're going to find out that it's basically a third physical, a third mental, and a third emotional. You all three become, go ahead, go forward, next one, okay, next one, next one, okay. It basically becomes all three of these. If your child just learns forehands and backhands, and probably up until puberty, they'll do pretty well, just this part of it. Tennis is the how, where, when, and why. How, where, when, and why. The how is the physical part of the game. Your tennis will become your child may become a great ball striker, very physical, be very good at what they do, and that just becomes part of, part of the deal. What was it, Yogi Berra said that half of baseball is 90% mental or something? <laughs> <laughs> Did y'all ever hear that one? Well, tennis, tennis about 90% of tennis is 90% mental. And the point is, the mental <coughs> part of the game really is shot selection and the decisions that are made. This is technical. This becomes tactical. The emotional part is the finishing touch and becoming clutch. And of course, the emotion for the journey, the why. Being clutch, under pressure, and being able to take the game to deep levels because of the inner motivation. Go ahead. So this is how I do my total tennis training program. 
the physical one third to how the technical skills, all mechanical and te technical skills, overlearned to the place where they are automatic under pressure. Even when the kids are nervous and they're shaking, they can still execute. How many times do they have to do that? Uh, 2900, 1900, 2700 is what some sports psychologist told me one time. So I put it up there. I think some kids get it pretty quick. Some kids might not ever get it. But basically you do the repetitions. Repetition is the mother of skill. They have to do it, do it enough times to where it's just like hitting the brake. If a car pulled out in front of you, you just automatically do it. It becomes an automatic reflex for them to do that. It's beautiful to see the eye work that they were doing over here and that you train the automatic responses. The middle part of the tactical skill, shot selection, the ward law directionals, I'm think, I think it's the best thing going out there for shot selection. If we have time, we'll go through that this week. The win, the momentum, and match flow strategies. About 80% of my coaching I do with older kids is on momentum control, getting them to recognize that the momentum sometimes is against you, sometimes with you, sometimes against your opponent, sometimes with your opponent. I've since 1979, I've been working on momentum control and teaching the players how to control momentum based on grouping <coughs> points and basing on things that happen, the score and what happens. The emotional part is what we'll talk about a lot because that's where you'll, if you have an understanding of the emotional part of the game, you'll really, really help your child stay streamlined towards improve their tennis. How do, you, how do the children find the most, best emotional zone of comfort? They call it the zone or being in the zone. How do they find that? And then, of course, the why becomes first is their personal motivation for the journey. These are the handouts that you have in front of you. So I'm going to go forward. I've already explained the participation <laughs> stages are up until puberty. Participation, many formants, many experiences, family tennis, competitive tennis, just being around it to where they start to find what their purpose, it's like a painter who figures out whether they want to do expressionism, impressionism, or whatever it is, or a musician finds out they want to do the piano or the violin or whatever. Okay, then you have the post-puberty, next one there. The post-puberty skills become more performance-oriented. Performance-oriented means that the children, now it gets more important. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have participation maybe in a high school event for 17-year-old kids or participation in league play or something like that. But when it gets participation, performance, and becomes more selective, then it becomes really important. The comp competition with tournament formats and significance, playing complete matches, not these, pardon me, referees, but these 10-point tiebreakers are about the worst. It's, a, it's the we're self-sabotage we do to ourselves because all of the learning takes place in the third sets. All of the learning for your children takes place in the third sets. I've been to the USDA, they've heard me, I wear them out, I send them handouts. It would be better if they played a tiebreaker of the first set and played full set for the second and the third. Okay? No, oh yes, we are. I, I send them 11 scoring systems. But listen, my mama used to say too, a squeaky wheel gets the oil. If it squeaks too loud, it gets removed. <laughs> Every one of you need to squeak. Every one of you need to stand up and speak out, stay professional, address issues, never people. You can, you can be mad at the formats all you want. I'm on that National Junior uh, Competition Committee. I got on there and I'm, I'm getting baptism, baptism by fire. It is really interesting. A bureaucracy that the USTA is a bureaucracy, that our government is a bureaucracy, the NCA is a bureaucracy, the ITA is. Bureaucracies are like a great house that you made in the 1960s, and then you start adding rooms on, and you add another room and another room and another. Then today you gotta go find a screwdriver, you gotta walk through three closets, 18 bathrooms, and two kitchens just to find a screwdriver. And that's the best I can say. Great people working, but but these scoring systems really hurt the development of players. Single elimination competition and doubles competition. Single elimination. Some of you say, well, we go to the tournament, we don't want just one, no. Kids will learn how to win when they dislike losing. It's, you only win to the level that you can't stand losing down to. 
Tennis is a pecking order sport. Look, tennis is like marathon runners. You have a pod of marathon runners and another cluster and another cluster. When kids want to improve to a level, they've got to break out of their comfort zone, leave all their friends, everything that was in their pecking order, run by themselves and hanging upside down, go to the next group, and guess what? Those marathon runners say, get out of here, get out of here. We don't want you in our group. <clears throat> they have to be an outcast until they earn the respect in their group. So the point is, when kids dislike losing, they learn how to win. Now this is, again, this isn't participation stage. This is the, what, performance stage. There's a reason why we're not developing champions in our country. We give participation trophies. We want huge draws that kids don't have to work to get into. We want all our kids to feel good about themselves. So what we've done is we've taken the old bell-shaped curve that used to be 25, 20, 60, 20, and now it's like five because we bring in all the kids that really are nice kids, <clears throat> but they didn't earn their way there. And then 590, and then five, the kids don't run forward because there's too much risk hanging upside down, being by yourself, and there's lots of reward for being, media, media, being mediocre. So anyhow, with that single elimination competition, mentoring responsibilities we're going to come to. We've got about a few, five minutes here. Okay. Becoming a competitor, understanding and managing pressure of competition. Okay, go ahead. All right. <coughs> this is a game of pressure. It's a high beta game. Pressure makes diamonds, we always tell the kids. This is from 1969. You all probably have seen it in your psychology books. I saw it in 1969, my freshman psychology 101 book at Tennessee Tech where I went to college. And this was called the Yates Inverted U Hypothesis. And they said nothing happens as pressure increases, performance increases until there's an optimal place where pressure works well and then too much pressure is poor. Now some people can operate with higher levels of pressure, some people with lesser amounts of pressure. But the point is this, if the kids have no pressure, have you ever noticed when your children get ahead they play worse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's no pressure, the hand-eye coordination mm -hmm. doesn't work, mm -hmm. basically. When they, when they press, when they get scared, their hand-eye coordination doesn't work. It has to be, the pressure has to be that medial amount of pressure. And where is it? I usually say it's the child before they're playing, they're going like this. Whew. Okay, yeah, mom, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right, I got it, I got it. Okay, no, no, no. What? And then they just they want to be by themselves and they'll, they'll be a little nervous. And, and this is good. This is good. They're getting ready for their optimal performance when they feel a little bit of pressure. The worst thing you could ever say to your children when they go in to play somebody as good is you don't have anything to lose, have fun and do your best. <coughs> they always lose. They will always lose. What you're really saying is I'm checking out of the hotel, we're getting ready to head home. <laughs> Never, ever, ever say that. You're making the opponent the constant and your child the variable. With work, your child needs to become the constant. The opponent is the variable. Yes? I just want to say, I'm Russian. And I know that it's very easy to uh, get on the other side and put too much pressure. Yes, there is. Yeah, and, and that. And that's, I know it's from Russia. I know how it is there. The, the and, screaming and, and I you know, worked in Thailand for, you know, with Thais about two years. And they were so laid back. They were just like, here, 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 the Russians are here. And, uh, you know, in different parts of the United States, the East Coast kids are a little harsh. And you're right, but the point is, is this is different for every child. Your child has their optimal competitive zone. Okay, I've got one more point to make, and then we'll come back to this tomorrow. Okay, good. This is the Jim Lair circle of competition. And this is brilliant. Jim Lair is a great sports psychologist. And he says that the outer ring is when the child tanks, they give up. They got the Q virus. 
This anger is a little better than tanking, but really anger is a way of tanking. It is when you lose your control, lose your head in tennis, you lose it. He said you must stay in a choking zone or the challenge zone. Nobody likes to talk about choking, but usually the best competitors, <laughs> listen, Roger Federer got into the choke zone at the U.S. Open. Remember the 1540 game that he shanked the ball? Remember? <coughs> and remember Rafael Nadal at the Australian Open last year? All he had needed to do was make that little backhand down the line and his hands didn't release and he went, hit the ball out of bounds. That cost him the math. The pros get into the choke zone, but they learn how to manage choke challenge, choke challenge. The longer you stay in the choke zone, go backwards. The longer you stay in the challenge zone right here, you're right here. This is my last story, then we, we'll, we'll break till tomorrow. Tomorrow's on scheduling. We're going to finish this up and then on scheduling. I used to bring in to my locker room, I would go down to the hardware store and I'd bring back. My mother used to cook some of the meat. We had six children, but she used to cook it in one of these pressure cookers. You all know what a pressure cooker is? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, I, I mean, you know, it wasn't the finest quality of meat, right? It was, I don't, I don't know where, but she could make it. She could tenderize that meat because she would clamp it down and she would have the old pressure cooker you'd clamp down and then it would have that release valve that had an iron ball on top and it would go like that. As the pressure pushed up, it would and it wouldn't push it all the way off, but it wouldn't hunker down. It would, it would release the pressure and it kept the right amount of pressure into the pressure cooker. So what I'd do is I'd always draw a picture of this and I'd say, your opponent in the situation is like fire. Maybe it's a big flaming situation. It's the semifinals of a big tournament and this is an opponent you don't like playing and they're playing great, that's the fire is raging. Or maybe it's an easy match and it's not too hard, you just got a little fire going on. But the point is, is that you cannot control the opponent or the situation, it's there, okay? And once it's clamped down, if there was, of course, no release valve, it would explode. And if you had no pressure down, it would boil the meat and it would be as tough as leather. It wouldn't cook. You needed X amount of pressure. You needed X amount of pressure. So I, I tell players, the only thing, what is the only thing that the player learns to have control over? What's the only part of that pressure cooker? The fire? The pot? What? Himself. The what? Himself. The him, himself. But what is him? It's the what? The valve. The release valve. They have to know that I'm tight. Players, I've had players get out and jump rope 30 times between games, and they're okay. I've had players, I told the kids earlier today, when your hand's breaking down, I said, why do you tie your shoes? Your fine motor skills work, your hands break down, they come back. I used to have my players have a piece of a notebook on the court, and I'd say, sign your name in cursive 10 times between games. And at first it's like that, and they're like, whoa, your hands come back. You've got to bring your fine motor skills back. But the pressure curve has to be right. Now, now here's, here's the point on that. The thickness of the walls of that pot, it can either be aluminum foil or it could be solid iron that thick. What do you think that represents? When I, what I would tell the kids in the, in the pressure cooker. The thickness of the walls of that pot. No, the amount of pressure is caused by the fire and release valve. By what? What do they have? What do your kids have control of each and every day of their lives? Oh, they think. The what? Emotions. No, the emotions is controlled by that. How? What? But 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 what do the look? If if it's too, if it's the pressure comes up and it's tin foil and there's a lot of pressure, it's going to blow a hole out. Somebody said practice. 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 It's how good your game is. It's how good your game is. It's the repetitions they've done. So they want to do enough repetitions to where when they're choking their brains out, they can still get it done. Okay? They want to do enough repetitions to where when it is the Super Bowl moment or when it's serving the match out in the biggest match of their lives, 
they can do their routines, and they can come up and they know that they know that they know that they've done enough repetitions to where, what did we say about the physical part of the game? Do enough repetitions to where it's automatic, unconsciously competent, unconsciously competent under pressure. So that represents the wall or the thickness of, of the thing. So you, they do their practice so they know that they know that they know that they've got game even when they're shaking, even when they're nervous. And if they do it themselves with their own reticular activation system and their own passion and their own initiative, they own it. And when they own it and they, things go good, they grow. If, it, if you lead them to the courts every day, if you do everything for them, if you put them through everything, the steps, when they win, they win them, it's sort of like renting a car. It's really not theirs. You want them to embrace every achievement they have. So when they win, their confidence goes up. And when they lose, it stays the same. Lose, 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 win, win, finally. If they don't own, have ownership of their successes, they win, it goes up. They lose, come down. Win, win, lose, lose, win, lose. They never go anywhere. They have to, you see this all the time, quick rise, quick fall. <clears throat> And I'll end with a little slack on the 10-point tiebreaker again. You know, I, I said the 10-point tiebreaker is sort of like fighting eighth round of a boxing match. Can you imagine? You finally, after two hours, second set, the person's done. They would never win a third set. In the boxing match, they're ready to go into the fighters, ready to go into the ropes, and the referee goes, time out! Okay, now everybody take a five-minute break. And we're going to fight as hard as you can for 30 seconds to see who wins. <laughs> Isn't that silly? I had a kid in Texas just say recently from Dallas, you know uh, Johnny Me. Johnny Me. Johnny is I was just with him down in Florida. Johnny says, Coach, I just had this knockdown drag out in Dallas. It was about 100 degrees. And he says, I want a 13-11 tiebreaker. And the kid comes up to me afterwards. The, the, he comes up to me right after first set and shakes hands and says, no, nah, your match, I default. He says, if I had won that first set, I was going to tank the second set and try to win the tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. So do you see what we're, te we're teaching our kids to do? Yeah, those, those kind of things. It's just awful. Tell the tournament directors, we don't agree with these. You don't have to play these. You know, you can play a lot of other things. Start the third set of 3-3 three, three in the third. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, folks, look, uh, we, we're going to, we're done for the day. Uh, I, look, I am here all week, and, and I am glad to set up one-on-one -on -one time with you. I'm in the hotel. I'm glad to talk to you about anything at all with your youngsters. We're all beginners at being parents. Um, tomorrow, I want to bait you a little bit, the scheduling part, if you will save your children time with the scheduling. And once they do all this wonderful training, the scheduling is where everybody gets messed up because you schedule on emotion a lot of times and they don't schedule on what the children need to go through the standpoints. Okay, thank you for today, tomorrow.